Well, hello, all nations. It's great to be with you. It's kind of strange being in the dead silence here at, what, 3.40 in the morning, and yet you guys are alive and well. Of course, it's morning for you. Maybe you're hoping I'll get done real quick so you can finally go have some breakfast or lunch. What we're going to talk about today um, is kind of the part two of something I did for you a couple of months ago. Seeing Beyond Your Religion, part two, grasping divine reality beyond a biblical worldview. And that I use that phrase, grasping divine reality beyond a biblical worldview, because I don't know about the UK, but in America, there's this thing about having a biblical worldview. And uh, hopefully by the time we're done today, we may need to reshape that thinking a little bit. So the last time I was with you, and if I look down, that's because that's where you are on my computer. The camera's up here. So between that and my notes, it's not that I'm trying to be rude. The last time I was with you, we discussed the first part of this topic, uh, seeing beyond our religiousness and seeing people as people, if you remember, instead of seeing them through the lens of our doctrines. Yet the reason many times we see people in relationship to our religious doctrine is because of our approach to God, not necessarily because of how God approaches us. It became a bit clearer through using three pivotal examples where Christ's encounter with people was completely different than the so-called biblical approach of his time. Who, like many of us, the Pharisees, for example, are more concerned about what we understand to be scripturally correct, the right and wrong of scripture, than resembling our Heavenly Father through nature and emanation. So let me reiterate a key point that we made the last time. In the same way that Solomon said, quote, But will God indeed dwell in the earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you. How much less this temple which I have built. That's 1 Kings 8.27. In the similar fashion, the apostle John said, again, quote, There are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen. Close quote. John 21. 25. In other words, while we're quick to say God cannot dwell in a tent or a building made of brick and cement, and we herald, yeah, that's right, we're the church, not a building, we need to include the words of the Apostle John in this way. God in Christ cannot be contained in the library of books either. Even the 66 books of what we call the Bible, what we call the Bible can't contain the fullness of of all who God is either. Whether it's a building of canvas, brick, or cement, the same applies to books. In addition, the Bible isn't a flat didactic constitution, which we refer to as the Word of God. If every word, for example, especially in the New Testament, is to be interpreted as an injunction from God, then we have a major problem with context. For example, starting with Colossians chapter 4, verse 16. Now, when this epistle is read among you, see to it also that the church, it's read in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. Case in point. If there are several historical avenues we could take regarding such a, whether a, such epistle exists, or whether it's an epistle under another name, or the fragment that we do seem to believe we found is a forgery, the problem is it's not in the New Testament canon, and if every word of the New Testament is supposed to be taken as a constitution, then we're disobeying God by not having the epistle of Laodicea and reading it. On top of that, maybe we should be scouring the earth for it rather than Noah's Ark. Of course, you know, in, uh, in the U.S., you probably know, we couldn't find Noah's Ark, so we decided to build an amusement park and a so-called replica of it in Kentucky. Cost us millions, but hey, that's just the way we do things, I guess, sometimes. Today, we're going to look at both the contrast of being scripturally correct and yet being spiritually void. In contrast to emanating the life of Christ to both ourselves and others. 
So we're going to start with two in-your-face moments when Jesus encountered two more people. In this case, both are women, which any proper religious biblical scholar of Jesus' day would have a serious problem. And yet, God clearly didn't have a problem at all. You probably will know this first one very well. In John 4, 7 through 23, it reads like this. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink since I'm a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. She said to him, where then do you get this living water? Jesus answered and said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a wellspring of water, excuse me, a well of water springing up to eternal life. The woman said, sir, give me this water so I won't be thirsty. He said, go call your husband and come here. The woman said, I have no husband. And Jesus said, you said correctly, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you have truly said. The woman said to him, I perceive that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place to worship. Jesus said, believe me, the hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem you will worship. The hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. Sure, you know that story of the woman in the well. But I want to highlight a couple of things. The first is in the beginning segment here, if you knew the gift of God. Now, this segment of John's gospel is Jesus' first encounter with a, a so-called outcast sinner and not just a breaker of one of the minor uh, commandments, or one of the 613, for example, but one of the front end big 10. Mind you, those are the ones written on the tablets of stone on Sinai by Moses. This is none other than the story of the woman at the well. The reason for the picture of Dermy Moore here from a movie, which was adapted from the book a book written in 1850 called The Scarlet Letter. It's based on historical fiction because it relates to what we're talking about, so I thought I would include this here. Now, for those of you who don't know, historical fiction, which seems like a contradiction in terms, means that the events truly happened, but we're telling the story through fictional characters. In The Scarlet Letter, it takes place in Boston, Massachusetts, here in the U.S., in the 1640s. Hester Prime is her name, similar to the woman at the well, is an adulteress who got pregnant out of wedlock and is sentenced by the Christian authorities to stand on a scaffolding for three hours to be exposed to public shaming. And then after that, she is to wear the scarlet letter A for the rest of her life so everyone would know what kind of sinner she was. Now, mind you, this is that same state within 50 years who would then have the famed witch trials. Just to give you some perspective, the town where the witch hunts occurred had a population of 600 people, give or take a few. In some cases, the area is known as Salem, which is actually a little bit larger and had a population of about 2,000. Now think of this. In the name of the Christian God, their so-called Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in Salem, they rounded up and accused 200 people of witchcraft. That's 10% of the broader population and one third of the population where this all occurred. Can you imagine one third? Most of who were found guilty were publicly hung and in a few cases where some wouldn't confess their sin, you can imagine this, they were, rather than just being punished by death, they were sent to what's called the press. The press is where they lay you down on a wooden slab and then put another wooden slab on top of you. 
And then they begin to put heavy rocks on it to increase the weight exponentially, which will then kill the suspect from the weight through crushing asphyxiation, of course, until they get a confession. And of course, once they get a confession, it's followed by a public execution. Fun. Once a confession is given, okay, and followed by the public ex execution, of course, that person is put on display as a sinner and a witch. Now, today, we don't wear scarlet letters, but we do still brand people as sinners in different ways and make them known as such. Nonetheless, regardless of how we do this, now in our time, let's see how Jesus handles such situations with the, the, with the divine living word of truth. And I brought in the Demi Moore story to this just, just to help us think for a minute. And that, of course, is 1,600 years ago. But we're doing similar things. I don't know what it's like in the UK totally, but in the US, we can do horrible things to people in the name of Jesus and be scripturally correct when we do it in our minds. That story of the Scarlet Letter definitely displays what I would call Christian, their version of what they think is Christian holiness that brought totally de total destruction and shame to a person let alone uh, later death to many in a community, one third being round up to do so. That's, that's just crazy. In our last lesson's example of the disciples asking Jesus if the man born blind was in the situation because of sin, either he committed or his parents, Jesus was clear when he said, neither this man sinned nor his parents. Rather, we must work the works of God. Why that statement? Because as we pointed out, the disciples assumed, based on what their understanding of scripture was, that there must have been a sin and a subsequent judgment from God that made the man blind. But Jesus was clear. What you're imposing into the situation as the works of God isn't. We must work the works of God, which is to neither accuse him nor his parents, but bring life-giving healing. Jesus basically said, I don't have eyes that see sin. I have eyes that sees a human being in my likeness who needs to know how wonderful and valuable he is. This passage about the woman at the well is no different. Jesus asks for a drink to begin a conversation about how he could bring true spiritual life. Yet the woman asks, why are you talking to me? I'm a Samaritan and you're a Jew. Again, repeating what we talked about last time, a wrong question cannot produce a right answer. Like the disciples who asked the wrong question to Jesus about the man born blind, in her case, she was not only a woman, but a Samaritan, which as far as the Jews were concerned, were a lesser race of people. Let me make a point. There is no wrong question when a person's intention is to learn and grow. But a wrong question, and I don't like using the terms right and wrong. You know me for a while about tree and knowledge of good and evil, right and wrong and stuff. But to make a point today, a qu uh, there, there is, in a sense, a wrong question if one is egoist egoistically inspired to trap, like the one the Pharisees asked Jesus regarding whether they should pay taxes to Caesar. Similarly, many times one that ones that come from anger, pain, and religious bias are questions that already have an answer imposed. On the positive, one that comes from anger and pain can be healed once the perspective is redirected, yet it takes time and persistence. Religious ones, on the other hand, are way more difficult because they assume the posed question is already right. So Jesus tries to refocus the woman and says, if you knew the gift of God, you would have asked. If you knew the gift of God, you would have asked. In other words, you really didn't ask the right question here. Let me, let me help you out. Here's the problem. She didn't know who, who was asking her for a drink. Why? 
because despite of all the knowledge of scripture, worship, the knowing of all 613 commandments, the proper temple location and the priesthood, she didn't know the gift of God. We'll get back to that. The second part of this is Jesus presents to her the gift of God in light of exposing that, she, that he knew of her situation intimately, which both she and all the Samaritans and Jews would consider horrible sin. He said, go call your husband. At least she partially was honest with the reply, I don't have a husband. And Jesus exposes everything. Not only are you unmarried, but you have should have, in a sense, five scarlet letters, and the man you're now living with isn't even your husband, that would make a sixth. Keep that idea in the back of your mind. We'll come back to that. Now, remember from the last time, we pointed out when Jesus saw the man born blind, he used the phrase, idion anthropon, which means what we says, and he saw a man. Well, idion anthropon means he saw a human being. He saw a person. Edon Anthropon, he saw a son of Adam, who is the image and likeness of God. However, when the disciples asked him about that man, the phrase they used is tis armiten hutos, which means who sinned? That guy? That one? They didn't see a human. They saw the guy that's a sinner. Totally different form of language there. What Jesus saw and the religious disciples saw were two very different things. In the same way, Jesus sees a woman who's the image and likeness of God, not a six-time adulteress. Can you imagine what he must have thought 1,600 years later of women having to wear scarlet letters, getting a confession out of supposed witches through pressing, all in his name? Yet still, the woman at the well asks the wrong question a second time. Um, I don't know where it becomes... Which mountain do we worship on? Wait, what? While this woman is, in effect, caught in adultery six times, the religious serpentine tree of the knowledge of good and evil programming is still at work asking the wrong question yet again. Finally, Jesus refocuses the entire situation. Worshiping here or there is irrelevant. No different than when the disciples asked who sinned this man or his parents. It's all besides the point in the kingdom of God. In the end, the woman drops her water pot, knowing that God knew of her situation and didn't condemn her. So she runs into the city as an emissary of Jesus, tells the men of that city about him, and they follow her to the well to listen to the living word Jesus himself. She had five husbands and was living with the sixth. Now, consider the number of mankind is six according to Genesis 1 26 through 31. Consider also two chapters earlier in John 2 verse 6 when Jesus told the disciples to fill water pots with water he turned them into wine and there were also six of them. In Hebraic thinking such numerical coincidences are there for a reason. In Hebraic thinking the number six is that of mankind. In 1 Kings 18 33 the word for water pots is Kadim Mehim, which means vessels of chaos. She dropped her vessel of chaos and went into the city with purpose. In similar matter, Jesus turned the six mankind vessels of chaos into the wine of the spirit. This moment is a moment of transformation of identity, not religious moral conformity. It seems appropriate before we continue that this is a good time to pause and consider something. Jesus didn't tell the woman, you're right, I'm a prophet, and you're living in sin. He didn't tell the woman, wait, before you go running off and preaching about me to others, get your life right. Repent of being an adulteress five times over and either marry the man that you're living with or have a move out until you're ready to do so. No, none of the above. Rather, it was all about if you knew the gift of God, you would know who's speaking to you. And what's more important than all the religious 
scripturally accurate legalistic rituals is the eternal drink from the well of wonderful everlasting life full of grace and truth the great I am wants to give us. Consider. When you consider the gift that is speaking to you, you discover the gift also that is within you. So here's a thought for present day. While people are talking about why people leave churches or some socialistic or political agenda that's trying to stop Christianity and so on, maybe Jesus gives us the best answer to a redirected question. Now, before I suggest that question, let me also suggest this. Many today are giving their version of right answers and prophesying such, and many are saying amen to it. However, giving an answer to a wrong question isn't a right answer, let alone life-giving from the nature of God himself. It just makes good sense to the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which doesn't require any spiritual horsepower to grasp. Whatever versions of the scarlet letter we are imposing on so-called sinners today isn't the right answer. Jesus would refocus the question to, what would cause people to come to me? After all, people leaving isn't an issue. For that matter, Jesus clearly would have left many of our churches as well. Consider the warnings in Revelations chapter 2 and chapter 3. Why? Because we have no part in scarlet letters, public or private shaming, not to mention some kind of death penalty for unconfessed sin. Some may say, yeah, but we would never do such a thing. Think again. When the so-called gospel is reduced to, God loves you and wants you to love him back. But if you don't love him back, you're going to be tortured and burned forever in hell. Hmm. Think that through for a minute. No different. The question Jesus is asking today is what would cause people to come and stay? Clearly, the first response is based on what we studied in the last lesson. And here's the tough thing for a lot of us because we're so programmed. Get the sin issue out of the equation. Just like the man born blind or the woman at the well. The second is this, a person's lifestyle, religiously correct or not, is irrelevant. Whether they were married five times and living with a person or not, or pick some other sin deemed heinous, it's irrelevant. Rather, give them the wellspring of life and let that do what it does. Or do we not truly trust God to do what only God can do? Thus, whether they correct their legalistic situation from our religious point of view or not as extraneous at best. Understand, the wellspring of life isn't trying to correct a person's life from sin to sainthood. Rather, it's simply offering them the fullness of their true divine identity. There's a big difference from grasping the revelation of who we are to simply doing right things. And in some cases, Once you know who you are, even what will seem contrary to those who think they know what is right, (laughs) what you become and what you manifest may be completely different. Here's a note. Now, some of us may have just added, well, by knowing who she is, she will correct her sinful, adulterous life, right? After all, that's the objective, to stop sinning, right? Once again, a wrong question leading to a wrong answer that seems mm, so right. No, think this through for a minute. Such just missed the point and added something to the narrative that's not in the mind of God. Now, let me show you exactly what I mean by adding something to the narrative that changes the context and can change our view of God's heart. Now, take a look here. Now, first of all, the picture on the left uh, where Demi Demi Moore was is an actual stoning of a woman in the Middle East for sinful behavior. She's put into that hole and they were throwing stones at her. Killer. Still going on today. John 8, 2 through 11. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. 
they made her stand before the group and to Jesus and said to Jesus, excuse me, teacher, who is this? This woman was caught in the act of adultery and the law of Moses. It commanded us to stone such a woman. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis to accuse him. Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, if any of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Now, I'm going to highlight something here for you. The notion of a woman caught in adultery and to accuse Jesus just a few chapters after the six-time adulterous woman just ver- remember she uh, just won an entire city to Christ. They all came out to him. Was an issue to the Pharisees. Um, in my view, you don't have to agree, but it's highly possible this was the same woman. And I'll tell you why in a minute. And you'll see a connection. Being caught in the act of adultery, first of all, in that culture, doesn't mean the Pharisees were peering peering through the window, waiting for her to have sex with the guy she's living with. Rather, just by living with the man that was not her husband and the fact that she was married before is was classified as adulterous. So it, it was it maybe it wasn't exactly like some of us had thought. But here again is a very straightforward wrong question that would have never engendered a life giving answer. They tried to trap him to accuse him based on not doing what they thought the word of God said as it pertained to its rules. Instead, the living word of God, Jesus, bent down and started to write on the ground. He wasn't just ignoring them and doodling. In Jeremiah 17, 13, and here's the connection, it says, quote, O Lord, the hope of Israel. Listen, all who forsake you shall be put to shame. Those who turn away from you shall be written in the earth, for they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living water. It's very possible here what Jesus was actually doing was fulfilling that very scripture and pointing that out to them. Now, consider this now with the next part. So here's this woman, verse 8. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And this At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now, and then I have written lightly, if you can see it on the screen, and leave your life of sin. That's the NIV. Now consider the Hebraic metaphor here. Jeremiah said, those who turn away from you shall be written in the earth. And verse 9 above, it says, those who heard began to go away one at a time until only Jesus was left with the woman. If we take Jeremiah's point of view, they weren't leaving because Jesus convicted them of their sins, like many of us have thought. I know I did for years but because they were unwilling to let go of their condemning legalistic religion and as a result turned away from the Lord. Hence, Jeremiah's prophecy is fulfilled. Then we have the issue of the reinsertion of religion back into the text, which is the example I'm ultimately pointing to right now based on what I mentioned earlier. This is why the phrase, and leave your life of sin, or as in other translations, go and sin no more, is light on your screen. Because the original text never had that in there. That's an addition put in there by scribes later on. Neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared, go now. That last statement, and leave your life of sin, is added. Why? Because the very thing that the Apostle Paul warned us in his epistle to the Galatians and in Acts 20, 29, which is that there would be those who would creep in and pervert the gospel of Jesus Christ, which, whether done intentionally or some kind of misguided form of piety, really don't matter. 
regarding the woman at the well and the wellspring of life, it's not trying to connect, correct her morality. It's trying to give her identity, which many times takes care of itself. And yet at the same time, maybe she, we don't know. The story just ends. We don't know if she ever got married to the man or not. Why? Because it's not relevant. Now, I want you to consider something. I'm not just saying that this was added. Erasmus, Calvin, Beza, Grotius, Wettstein, Titman, Knapp, the Codex, Sinaiticus, the Alexandrian Codex, the Codex of Vaticanus, and the Codex Ephraimi Rescriptus, if I said that right, and more, all point to the fact that this text was added. Many point to Bishop Papias of Hariopolis, a contemporary of Polycarp, as the one who added it to the gospel. If you think about it, that changes everything. Because it almost seems to suggest that, well, has anyone condemned you? No one, sir. Then neither do I condemn you. Now go, if we add and sin no more, it's almost like, well, I didn't condemn you this time, but if you mess up again, it's going to be a bigger consequence. But that's not the text. As a matter of fact, for those of you who like to study Study any of these these men if you want uh, uh, the Barnes uh, commentary, for example, which speaks of this also points out that actually from a portion of the seventh chapter of John all the way to this point seems to have some of these sporadic additions and changes. Many of the thing is, is we don't most of us don't know that we preach it like like it is, but there there are commentaries and and lexicons etc that are telling us this stuff. But there's something about it, so I think we're afraid that if there's something in the Bible verses that don't measure up, we think all of a sudden the book is not valid. And for somehow our faith gets shaken, which really tells you something very important. Where are we really putting our faith? At Oasis of the Valley here, Part of our purpose statement is we are a Christ-centered people using the Bible as a tool, not a Bible-centered people hoping and assuming Christ will be a result. Clearly, after 2,000 years of Christendom, we have proven that when we put the Bible at the center without a revelation of Christ's love and compassion in our heart, things get ugly. From what? Stoning sinners, wearing scarlet letters, lynching, rioting, purified killing. Right now, just because we don't stone sinners or behead them or press them doesn't mean by putting them into an unconscious sleep before you inject them with a lethal injection isn't killing or make it any less humane. It's amazing to me how many people who claim Christ can thoughtlessly claim to be anti-abortion and yet be pro-capital punishment. How about this? We condemn Muslims, particularly extremists, for killing the infidel. And yet we say the gospel is this, that God loved you so much that he created hell just in case you don't love him back. What's the difference? There isn't any. Let me give you a few examples to make the point of how today we alter texts from the Bible, quote, the Bible we love, and in particular the New Testament, and in most cases never change the words on the page, even though the meaning is a long way away from what the heart of God is in that text. So, for example, the Apostle Paul never said this. Colossians 1, 12 through 15 giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light, for he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the light of the holy scriptures, through which we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins, for the Bible is the image of the invisible God, the revelation of all creation. Paul never said that. What Paul actually said is this. But how many times we read into scriptures, things like that. What he actually said is giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and translate, transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. 
He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. You catch the difference there? I think it's obvious, but at the same time, you also see how sometimes we have read things into scripture, even though that we had didn't really change the words. It's the thought we put into it. How about this one? Hebrews 1, 1 through 3. In the past, God spoke to the forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he's spoken to us through the Bible, whom he appointed the authority over all things. The scriptures are the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by its powerful word. How many times we maybe have read into that, things like that, or you've heard people read things into it. But actually what the text says, in the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son whom he appointed heir over all things, and through him he made the universe. The sun is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. How about this famous one? John 1, 16 through 18. The apostle John never said, from the fullness of the Bible, we have all received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through both Old and New Testaments. No one has ever seen God, but the Holy Bible in its entirety has made him known. Nope. John never said that. But how many times we've thought that? Actually, what John said is from the fullness of his grace, not the Bible, from his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Notice the, the paradox there. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. What's the first implication? Well, what came through Moses wasn't grace and wasn't all truth. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only who is the Father at the Father's side, has made him known. Notice the focus again. How about this one? That famous scene up on the Mount of Transfiguration. Behold, this is Matthew 17, 5 through 8. Behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is the Holy Scriptures with which I am well pleased. Obey them. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. But they were touched and heard, Arise, do not be afraid. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but the Bible. No, that's not how it went down either. How about this? Behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, do not be afraid. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Maybe that last statement is the real key. Maybe we've been looking at so many other things and we haven't been looking at Jesus only. And I don't mean that in some broad theological statement about Trinity or something like that. I'm pro-Trinitarian, yeah. but when seeing Jesus only is a refocus of our attention and faith. Yeah. That's why when we discover things in the text that maybe is not there. I mean, gosh, the more I've been studying, particularly New Testament, finding out there are many Greek manuscripts and some of them with considerable differences in text. If If, if the Bible is where I put my faith, then I missed the point. But if Jesus is where I put my faith and the Bible becomes a tool that I use, that changes the whole picture. Let me add one or two more thoughts regarding this before we make our final points and conclude. The Bible, the Old Testament, is a wonderful tool written and inspired by men as they understood God for their time. And through the Christ hermeneutic, 
And I like that. You know, we talk about hermeneutics and knowing when the Bible was written and the time it was written. There's also this thing what I uh, I forget who originally said it, but I picked it up years ago. I think it maybe was Richard Rohr or somebody said about the Christ hermeneutic, looking at everything in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation with the Christ hermeneutic, because sometimes translations, translators, and text sources miss the Christ hermeneutic and have inserted some of their own thoughts. Like I just proved to you that Bishop Papyrus of Holly, uh, Papias of, of Heriopolis did. The point is, is, as we look at the Old Testament, if we use the Christ hermeneutic, we can extract where it speaks of him and of us as his image and likeness. Yet where it doesn't, we can graciously leave it behind with respect and honor. The Bible, the New Testament, is a wonderful tool as well, written in by inspired apostles as they attempted to relate the eternal truth of Christ in terms and ideas to a diverse people in different regions of various religions so they could grasp the gospel message. Yet, we're not to take those terms and ideas of those regions and religions that the apostles spoke to as the gospel, but the divine concepts that the Spirit was trying to relate to us. As the Apostle Paul said, 2 Corinthians 3, 6, who also made us competent ministers of a new covenant, not of scripture, but of spirit. For the scripture slays, but the spirit makes alive. How about from the complete Jewish Bible? He has made us competent to be workers serving a new covenant the essence of which is not a written text, but the Spirit. For the written text brings death, but the Spirit gives life. Listen to me right now with great intent. Listen. I'm not, nor was the Apostle Paul, John, or Matthew, debasing Scripture. I'm rather putting it into perspective and intentionally putting Jesus, the resurrected Christ, in the exalted place he should be. What we've done in Western, Western Christendom is put our understanding of the Bible as the authority that defines Christ into a religion we follow. Rather, we should be putting the living word, the eternal Christ, as revealed in Jesus and with who is within us at the center of everything, which would require a lot more humility on our part, part, a lot more surrender on our part to grasp and understand. Think of it this way, a fellow Brit, his name is Brian McLaren, accounts in his book, A New Kind of Christianity, regarding some of these same issues. Now, this is my paraphrase. A friend of mine recommended me uh, that book uh, about a year ago when I was doing some teaching. He said, oh, wow, you sound like this. You should read this. Uh, and it was it was very encouraging. He said, when I was in second grade and was learning math, the textbook I used said that you can't subtract large numbers from small numbers. All remember that? In other words, you can't subtract 100 from the number three. Yet when I progressed a few grades later, my intellectual capacity was ready for a new chapter in my math book called Negative Numbers and Fractions. As we matured, eventually we were ready for a senior level textbooks that taught us advanced algebra, geometry, trigonometry, and calculus. We no longer even had numbers, positive or negative, but letters like X and Y with angles in their respective degrees. Now, for me personally, this is not McLaren's book, but an agreement I have. When I was 13 years old learning algebra, in what we call in the US middle school or junior high school, I complained and said it was too hard for me to grasp. You know, I'm not, I'm not a complicated guy. I, 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 it's too hard for me to grasp. I claimed that it was never going to be used in my life. Why would I care about what X and Y plus, you know, you know, Z squared is and all that? So why would I care? I mean, it's just stupid. Okay, fast forward 10 years. I took flying lessons. I eventually became a pilot. And here's the irony. Now at 23 years old, 
I'm in a cockpit of a single engine Cessna having to recall my algebra to calculate wind correction angles in order to get from one airport to the next. Let me share with you an uncomfortable truth. Having a big ministry, a large following of churches or people, people buying our media materials or being on a talk show or speaking at mega conferences doesn't necessarily mean we've truly discovered a Christ-centered life. It may mean we're gifted, like in prophecy, healing, and the rest, but according to Jesus, it doesn't mean that much, Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Consider this, Jesus called himself the Son of Man 83 times in the Gospels. Yet he called himself the Son of God only five times. Why? There's so much on this, we can do another message next week on just that topic. Uh, I even put it in the new Melchizedek book that's hopefully going to be coming out soon called Tree of Life Realities. But why? The point is, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The notion of the word made flesh isn't the Bible made flesh, but the divine thought of God made flesh in living reality, a person of the Trinity in human form. That divine thought is all encompassing grace and truth, nothing more, nothing less. It's all inclusive of all mankind. Why? Because he, Jesus, was and is the son of mankind. Here's the mind blower. Jesus is the incarnation of God. Jesus is the mind of God wrapped in flesh. And yet at the same time, he's not God's example for us, but God's example of us. Hence, what does it say about us? It's saying we are an inc incarnation of God as well. The only thing that stands before us, as usual, are two trees. The one of egoistic knowledge of what we determine is good and evil, whether it's religiously right or not. Or the tree of Christ-like life, which closes its eyes to a religious right and wrong. And please note the idea of religious right. Rather, it sees divine life, light, and love. In all the sons of mankind, because they are all the sons of God, consider this, you are a son of God. Whether you're conscious of it or not, whether people out there, are do, you may think, oh, they're doing so many terrible things. It doesn't matter. They're still an incarnation of God, whether they're conscious, in it, conscious of it or not. It's our job to awaken them to that truth. The challenge in this hour is to grow, really, from our rather binary view of the world while wearing a Jesus t-shirt, like a second grader using a textbook, into something not necessarily as complex as wind correction angles in algebra or calculus, but to see and express the Christ within us. No more dogmatic words on a page to which we need to adhere and obey. And for that matter, in fear if we don't. We need to move aside our Christianized religious construct and become a living expression of selfless compassion like the Christ. Yes. The reason for the picture that you see here on the screen with the tree is to suggest we need to see beyond the barren trees of obedience and laws which at best has a sparse view of God and see the flourishing trees of life full of grace and truth. I've often said regarding our spiritual life, when the student is ready, the teacher will come. You know, that's to encourage those of us who seem to perceive they are teachers to be consciously aware regarding where the student is in our process of teaching. But there's another part of that. And that's for the teacher. A true developing teacher knows their limitations despite their aspirations. So through humility and grace, not through egoistic fear or bravado, 
they empower a ready student. In the end, if Jesus is an incarnation of God, the revelation in human form, at the same time, he's the son of man. And guess what? You're a son of man, too. You are a son of God, too. That's who you are. I hope in this kind of compacted one hour in the middle of night, uh, I was able to communicate some points that as wonderful and as awesome as both Old and New Testaments are, they can't replace the living Christ within you. Our thinking of what we perceive Scripture to be should always be evolving and changing because we're evolving and changing. Um, years ago, a rabbi once said in a class I was in, he said, uh, have you ever read a scripture? And then a year or two later, you come back and read that scripture again, and all of a sudden it kind of jumps off the page at you. It wasn't that God was trying to communicate to you something new. It's that your inner state changed enough to actually perceive what was there. Yes. And that's really the key here. How is our inner states changing? So we can embrace all inclusively mankind as the incarnation of God. And I know this, you won't see mankind as an incarnation until you see yourself as one. And it doesn't come by being scripturally right. What it does come by is through humility and compassion from within. Doesn't matter how many Bible verses we know. With that, thank you very much, guys.